Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So in this episode, I'm going to respond to some of the great comments and answer some of the questions that you guys have left on prior videos. And hopefully you guys will get the answers that you've been looking for about your path to becoming an anesthesiologist. So stay tuned to see if your question about the path to becoming an anesthesiologist was answered and to get the information about the process that you've been looking for. I'm not sure if you've covered this already, but can you make a video on how you make being a mom and a doctor work? I have two little ones and planning on applying to medical school soon. So I have covered this before in a video called, how can you manage kids and go to medical school? So check that out, definitely check it out. And you know, basically it's a balance. It's a juggling act as I would like to say, but I try to strive for a balance where I am giving equal time to my children as well as my career. In medical school, I started off without any kids and then I had my first as a rising fourth year med student. So that was, I think, the best time to do it if there's anyone considering when to start because fourth year allows for a lot of elective time and off time where you know, you've finished most of your requirements and you have time for electives or you may just have extra time in your schedule. So that would be a good time to do it. But if you're going in already with children, as I've seen other people do, you just really have to be on top of your time management and you need support. You need to have either a family member or a caretaker, someone that can assist you outside of, let's say a daycare setting, you, you're gonna need it because you're gonna need time to study and that's not optional. So I would say as a mother, or a father going into medical school, always consider that support network availability if you have it. If not, how could you go about arranging that? And you know, if you're using loan money to support that, you, you're gonna have to, it's a necessary thing. So think about that part, because again, you're gonna need to study and you're gonna need to do it without distraction. I am a teacher who is considering medical school. I plan to apply to a post back. I have a master's, but it's not in the science field. So I plan to complete a post back and then apply to med school. I am 35 now. So to all the teachers out there that are considering medicine, I want to salute you. That was me. I was definitely in that boat where I was a high school teacher. I taught high school biology for three years. And all the while, as an undergrad, even before graduation and assuming this job, I already knew that I wanted to go to medical school, but I took some time off and I taught. So if you're in that boat and you've got another career going right now and you're ready to branch off into medicine, I salute you and I really support you. And I think that, you know, as you're going through your post back course or post baccalaureate science courses, um, you really need to focus on doing ex as well as possible because there's going to be a keen focus on those numbers. Your science GPA really matters and will make or break sometimes your admission to medical school. So really focus, really be you know, convinced this is what you want so you can put your all into it and um, you can do it. You know, I've seen it over and over again. So good luck to you. Thanks for the comment and all the best. And I'm always you know, of the mindset that it's never too late to do something. It really does not depend upon, you know, when you're getting started into it. People have gotten into this field late. I know there was a commenter that, you know, was older. He was 65. And I remember we were all, you know, going back and forth with him, asking him how the match went. And I don't think that, you know, even though he did not have a successful outcome this year, that, you know, he couldn't match in any other cycle. Every year is different. So I just really want to encourage people, you know, don't get discouraged by age. Really try your best to pursue this dream that you have. And I'm rooting for you and I hope that all goes well. And, you know, look to people for advice, you know, people that are close to you in medicine to help support you in this endeavor because it's, you need us. Doctor, can you react to a recent article on Medscape of a hospital that let go of all of its anesthesiologists for a full CRNA model? Is the specialty getting replaceable? So I've been getting a lot of questions, comments about asking me what my opinion is on this recent article that came out that describes a, a hospital in Wisconsin that is 100% CRNA run as far as the anesthesia department goes. 
and you know what I think about it and you know what my views are so I've commented a bunch of times with different people um, in response to that so I figured I'd just mention that here so anesthesia it's a vast field there's so many different ways and locations to deliver anesthesia especially if you're in an ambulatory setting or in a hospital that has high volume you're going to need a lot of hands a lot of anesthesia providers and I think that as a team, CRNAs and physician anesthesiologists really work well together and we get the job done. Um, there's always different models out there and there's always different demands out there. In this particular setting, this hospital had such a demand and you know it was always based on financial resources and revenue as well. So, you know, there's so many different factors that go into that decision. And in my opinion, I don't feel that there's gonna be, you know, no need for a physician anesthesiologist or that you know it's going to be hard to get jobs later on or in the future i don't i think that everyone has their role and their place in the world of anesthesia and you know we all have our strengths and we can play to them and take care of patients so like i was telling another commenter you know there's a lot of physician burnout there's a lot of healthcare worker burnout especially after this pandemic so, you know, all the hands that we can get on deck, we'll take them and, you know, let's get patients taken care of. Let's get all these patients taken care of in the safest way. So that's how I feel. And thank you for that comment. All those people who asked the same question, thank you guys for that question. And yeah. McBaggins, that's an appropriate name for this type of a comment as well. <laughs> Sounds like someone who's very financially savvy um, and knows all about the business of private practice and anesthesia. Thank you for your comment. So yes, that does happen where smaller groups that are privately owned and operated can be offered buyouts, you know, by other larger groups that want to acquire them. And, you know, those stakeholders in the group, the anesthesiologist, the person who has been on the partnership track may end up holding the bag, uh, no, no pun intended, um, at the end of it if the group does get bought out. So that's something to consider if you're in a partnership track or considering going into a partnership track, that there's always a possibility that your smaller group might end up bought up by a larger group. and. In that case, you're no longer going to be, or there's a very low likelihood that you're going to be um, allowed or given any partnership benefits, you know, dividends, things like that. So really think about that when you're getting into the private practice realm. And I've seen other people, you know, in this boat who actually did get some of the cash from the buyout, but they were probably already partners at the time. So think about that part as well when you're considering where to work. So... Dottie Stan and all the other commenters who have asked me if I do mentorship, I do want to say that it's a really limited thing that I can offer. And the reason why I started this YouTube channel was to provide a more vast range of mentorship to people that I've never even met, even in the form of just kind of talking about what it is anesthesiologists do, talking about my day, talking about how I got to this place in life and kind of offering the guidance that I wish I had along my path in that form. So this is your mentorship. Um, but for people who can actually, you know, access a mentor, I would um, highly recommend it, you know, to do that in person. So really do, you know, seek them out if you're in high school, if you're in college as an undergrad and you're considering medical school or pre-med, as a track, find yourself a physician mentor that you can speak with directly. For me, it's a little bit challenging to kind of orchestrate that within my hospital, but you know, if there are really pressing questions, I encourage you all to send me a DM through my Instagram, which is the same name as the channel, Three Anesthesia and Me, and I would try my very, very best to get back to you and um, you know, kind of offer you some advice in your specific situation. But I consider this uh, my crack at mentorship. Given my lifestyle and my constraints of time, um, being that I work full time and also have a full whole second job, as you guys know, which is being the mom of three girls at home. 
So thank you guys so much for that comment. In an ideal world, I would be traveling the country though. This is actually not something that I would probably enjoy public speaking and like doing engagements like that. That's not my blessing. I think that I'm better in a one-to-one -one situation, you know, in person, in this format which is basically me and the camera, me and the iPhone, and just going through, you know, the comments and kind of individually responding. Can we get another day in the life of you, maybe when you're doing other stuff in anesthesia or outside of the hospital? So another day in the life video, for sure. Could definitely work on that. Um, I just find that you guys don't really watch those as much. <laughs> so I will work on one that is a little bit interesting on a day that I have my airway management instructions so that you guys can see some of the different tools that I use on a regular basis when I'm teaching residents how to manage really difficult airways in the OR. So I'll do that as my next day in the life. So stay tuned. But while I'm finishing my lunch, I decided to take a little pause and respond to some of the comments that you guys have that I have yet to answer. Ooh, and as I'm filming this, my husband just says he's grilling steak tonight. Oh yes. Glad I had the salad. <laughs> so, Michael Woods asked a week ago, does an academic practice require fellowship training in order for you to be employed? And the answer is generally, it is very helpful. It is very beneficial to you to have additional training in a fellowship before entering the academic center. It will allow you to kind of niche your practice down, which is really, really helpful to avoid, you know, just being, in places that you don't really enjoy taking, like doing types of anesthesia that you really don't enjoy. So in my specific ex example of, you know, my path, I actually did not do a fellowship training. I came straight to work after residency and um, I'm a generalist. So I do pretty much everything other than really small babies, really sick kids and cardiac. And other than that, I pretty much do all types of anesthesia. So some people really don't enjoy having a big wide scope of things that they are responsible for doing. They may dislike other things and prefer other things. So it's really always good to kind of get yourself into a niche in anesthesia, I think, um, so that number one, you can become an expert in that. And number two, so that you can enjoy what you're doing every day. I'm a person that loves variety. I like to have different days. I like to have different cases. So for me, you know, being a generalist is great. Other people, they really don't you know, they don't get joy from that. So it just depends on you. So if you're interested in pursuing an academic practice, specifically one that is an academic center that is connected to a medical school that might be, let's say, an Ivy League medical school, you will definitely be expected to have a fellowship in your arsenal. Maybe some people even have two. So it just depends on where you want to work. I keep saying that phrase, but it's so true. And anesthesia really depends on where you want to work and what type of day-to-day -day lifestyle you think would make you happy. So go forth, do your fellowship in pediatrics, cardiac, OB, acute pain management or regional anesthesia, chronic pain. <laughs> you know, there's so many fellowships that you can do. So if you are considering academics and you really want to be extremely academic, publish papers and be an author and well published, then definitely go for that fellowship. You will be so much happier that you did and it will really serve you well. Also, one thing I didn't mention in I think the video that I was reacting to the Med School Insiders, I didn't mention that the fellowship training positions and also the private versus academic practice video that when you do fellowship training, you can earn extra in your base salary. There's definitely compensation and adjustments made for your fellowship and your experience. So that's also a part of it. So last question, and this is one that I don't actually get that often, but it does come up from time to time. And that is what are some study tips that I can offer for both the MCAT and USMLE step exams? So as I mentioned several times before, I'm sure in other videos, tests were not my thing. So I really had to develop strategies and really try to figure out ways that would work for my learning style to become successful and do well on tests. So for the MCAT, basically went into my captain review courses, did some extra time there, but most of my studies were done at home and, you know, just using the review materials to go over the key points for the basic sciences in my MCAT study and also to kind of go over some questions. And I, I used um, their sample tests. So 
so the practice tests were key for me. Same thing for the SEP. I used first aid, USMLE first aid, and I also, after going through those books, did a lot of practice tests. The NBME, National Board of Medical Examiners, had some practice exams. I would routinely schedule those to take as mock step exams and, you know, go based off of my score and figure out what things I needed to study again. So I think that having a nice regimen and using some structured board exam um, prep tools will really help you. And then lastly, I used USMLE World as a question bank throughout. So as I was going through um, my second year and just learning all those sciences, I was testing my knowledge with that. So as you go doing questions and figuring out where you need to build up is really key to help you get a good score. And those test prep courses were not cheap and so that was paid with borrowed money. So with that, I thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys so much for staying tuned to my channel. Please keep the questions and comments coming. And I will see you guys in the next video. Take care.